And now, ladies and gentlemen, we will proceed with our plenary sessions. We encourage you to, we encourage your active engagement through the Q&A sessions and through Twitter polling. Kindly have the Twitter handle at GIF Voting on standby. Our distinguished moderators will share the results during each session. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce the opening plenary session, which will be on private public dialogue on governance. Please join me in welcoming our esteemed panelists onto the stage. His Excellency, Dr. Hamad al Bazi, Vice Minister of Finance of Saudi Arabia. His Excellency, Ahmed al Sayed, Chairman, ADGM and Managing Director, Dolphin Energy. Alam Bijani, CEO, Majd al Fim. Rick Haythornthwaite. Chairman, MasterCard and Centrica, Advisory Partner, Molis & Co. And Lubna Al-Ulayyan, CEO, Ulayyan Financing Company. And our very capable moderator, John Defterius, Emerging Markets Editor at CNN. Glad to see the speechwriters for His Excellency Khalid Al Fale and Amin Nasser uh, obviously look at what they're writing and they don't copy and paste because that was <laughs> seamless in its uh, presentation. Uh, all jokes aside, I, I think we are honored, uh, and I'm sure Bader Jaffer would suggest the same, uh, to have such quality in terms of lead ins to a, a roundtable discussion uh, of this caliber. This is an excellent panel, by the way. Uh, and the issue of governance, if you're not careful, can be viewed from 35,000 feet, and you can just look at the big issues and not get to the core. I think with His Excellency's speech and uh, that of the President and CEO, uh, we can avoid that entirely, and I was busy taking notes uh, during uh, your speeches. It's interesting, in the Cabinet transition, uh, when His Excellency took on three different ministries, uh, energy, industry, and mining, I remember discussing before an interview, do you think you took on a little bit too much in this instance? He said, uh, no, I've got more capacity. I could even take on uh, more, including the chairmanship of Saudi Aramco. But there's a different way to think of it in the spirit of governance. Uh, if I had three different ministers across those ministries, uh, we would perhaps have a disjoining in policy going forward. So for the purposes in the Vision 2030 plan to have one minister across all three very key uh, pillars in the economy uh, provides continuity and even better governance. Uh, and in the issue of capacity, I remember doing a, a series of profiles and leading CEOs around the world uh, and spoke to uh, Carlos Ghosn, or Ghosn, depending on how I'd like to pronounce it, who at the time was the CEO of Nissan. Uh, they gave him Renault. He added Mitsubishi and one that's often overlooked, uh, the partnership with Dongfang in China, which is obviously the largest um, emerging market in the world. And I said, geez, isn't there a risk in governance with you trying to manage that many uh, different entities. And he says, no, I think I'm running at about 65% capacity. So I, I'm wondering when everybody hits their capacity uh, limit. But uh, I think in the spirit of governance, he made the same argument, uh, having the same person at the top and good support and very clear values allows us to push uh, the governance model. I think uh, Amin Nasser made a very, very good point. It's very simple here. If you had five key corporate values, I thought it was excellent that you suggested that citizenship is amongst them. Uh, because you can grow and you can try to reform, you can try to push through a Vision 2030 plan, but if you don't have the citizenship at the center of your policies, then we have to worry about jobs in the future uh, and stability as well, and I think it's a, a key point. There's plenty to talk about. We have one hour in which to do so, uh, as our esteemed uh, Master of Ceremonies was suggesting. Uh, we're going to do an uh, experiment, at least, with the GIF voting, so have your mobile phones ready because we want to get your poll. I uh, will have the results either right away or at the end of the session as well. And you'll see this throughout uh, the today here on the Pearl Initiative in collaboration uh, with Saudi Aramco. I think a good place for us to start, Vice Minister, uh, is the level of uh, corporate governance 
and on the financial initiatives when it comes to the capital markets authority in particular. Uh, Saudi Arabia has been able to go to the capital markets with uh, ease and raise money with greater demand than what the, the kingdom's been offering. Uh, at the spirit uh, of the Ministry of Finance, I, I know this with uh, interviews with Mohammed al Jadan, the minister, uh, that there's never been so much transparency in the kingdom right now. Uh, bring that microphone a little bit closer to you. But why was it important in the relationship with the Vision 2030 to make sure that there was standard reporting that came out every quarter, it was very transparent, and that led to a natural evolution uh, going into the capital markets as well. Were the two intertwined in your view when it comes to governance? Uh, thank you very much. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, let me first uh, thank the organizers for inviting me to participate in the, this very important uh, forum. And I'm really pleased to be here and to listen to distinguished speakers and participants and to benefit from their experience. I think the, uh, it's very it's well known. We are here in any in in forum or a discussion that I, I don't think that uh, nobody in this room doesn't know about governance or needs some kind of tutoring what gover governance is and how it's being conducted, the evolution of governance in the private sector and the, and the government. I will really not to, I'm not, I didn't prepare uh, some kind of theoretical uh, uh, discussion or at least a paper about this, but uh, talking about the governance in the, in, the, in, the, in the government, we all know that maybe some of you may uh, say that it started in the private sector under supervision of government and then it moved the same t terminology, the same approaches to the government with some varying degrees of ab uh, application and implementation. But as we know in, in, in government, as it is the case in, 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 in companies, there are limits to the resources and there are almost limits to the needs. So th there, there is a need to have some kind of strong governance to make sure that the government institution, organization, implements and achieves its objectives. The Ministry of Finance, for example, is not an uh, exemption to this. Mm. You know, in every country, and especially it's been quite been, uh, polarized and uh, focused following the financial crisis, many countries talked about the limited resources, financial resources, and the talk, talking about sustainability in the physical position in any country. And for us in the Ministry of Finance, we have been doing a lot in the past few years, three years, first of all to do the strategy, to, to design and de uh, devise the strategy and try to implement the strategy of the Ministry of Finance, which focuses on different components, pillars. One of them is the sustainable fina finance, or f to, to have sustainable financial resources. As you know, the government spending is very important. It's actually, it's the engine for growth in a country like Saudi Arabia. Yes, in our vision 2030, we are working hard to hopefully that to have the private sector a leader uh, to the, in, uh, for our development and sustainable growth. For, for this reason, and to have a very sustainable uh, financial resources and, and a strong physical position, we are applying the, the uh, governance with very imp important focus, uh, focusing transparency. We are, as, as you followed, and, and you, most of you know, we are now um, uh, uh, publishing quarterly reports on our budget. Not only that, but also on the physical balance program and is publicly published. You see even the, uh, the uh, looking forward about the uh, budget in the coming few years. Mm -hmm. This is to make sure that wh whoever deals with the government knows what the government's intentions are what the government, uh, what the government is, is looking for and uh, trying to, uh, to, to achieve. And for sure, the reception of the 
uh, our debt issuance in the international market, uh, given the, the situation in the financial market, as, uh, markets, international financial markets, as you all know, it's really, uh, first of all, a manif a manifestation of the, first of all, the strong Saudi economy, as well as the belief in the potential and the uh, plans of Saudi government. Therefore, we, uh, we see this as a vote of confidence in our policies and in our way uh, going forward to implement <coughs> our vision. Dr. Dvazai, very just a quick uh, follow-up, then I'm going to bring in Lubna Leon for her feedback uh, on this as well. Um, was it a radical change of mindset in the ministry uh, to go to that level of transparency and response on the budget uh, and uh, the revealing of your, your figures every quarter. Was it a mindset change at the ministry that took quite a stretch or not? It, it's a change, but it's an, I, I, I shouldn't call it radical because we have this, the, the, the information available. Actually, we have every uh, thing is being registered and you know the financials need to be uh, uh, detailed and accounted for because there are a lot of checks and balances. We, we have to, to know every halala uh, or real where it goes and from where it comes. Therefore, just publishing this is very important just to, to show that we have nothing to, to, to hide. Okay, very good. Lubnolian, when we had a conversation earlier this week on the phone uh, in preparation for the panel, you said, look, I, I think I should address the Capital Markets Authority and how much change there's been implemented here in the kingdom and the confidence that builds in this transformation. It's not an easy transformation. And in fact, at the start end of the transformation, it was uh, contending with you know, 26 to $30 oil, which uh, provided enough stretch on its own. What are your thoughts on the evolution of the Capital Markets Authority? It's one of many questions I have for you, but let's start there. Oh, thank you. While in our conversation there, I was uh, trying to allude that it would have been good to have someone from here, from CMA. But for us as an investor in the Saudi market, we're very comforted by the guidelines and the monitoring that the CMA does give on the Saudi equity markets. And I have to say, sitting on the board of two companies, we continue with two publicly listed companies. We're a private company. We continue, continuously receive guidelines from best of class and picking up on the best governance structure for a board. I mean, one of the recent things is that we have received, which is similar to other countries, is when, when, is, when an independent director become an insider, is it the tenor, is it the time? And there is a, con a focus now that maybe nine years an independent director is gonna, and I think that is a practice. So what I wanna say is, that the Capital Markets Authority here is really keeping an eye on the best practices. Now I'll speak from an investor point of view. An investor is very careful where to put his money. And you really, as we say in Arabic, Ras al-Mal Jaban, capital is a coward. And what you want to, you want to put it in a place where you know it's in safe haven. This is one of the reasons why the US is in great demand because they have very good governance in this. And what I want to say is, not that I'm blowing, uh, you know, uh, I really want to compliment our uh, uh, capital markets authority and the governance here, because we as investors have every confidence of putting money in Saudi Arabia in the public equity market, because there is tremendous transparency, quarterly reporting, very strict about insider information, and all of this is part of really uh, supervising it's really the supervision of good governance in boards. Good. A few years ago, we had a couple of blow-ups with family trading groups, mm -hmm. as you all know, and I mm -hmm. remember coming here and covering it uh, and speaking to the central bank, and they said they're so disturbed by the fact that uh, private groups didn't feel like they needed to have the governance. Uh, His Excellency what? pointed out the governance within the Oleon group. I, mm -hmm. your, your track record speaks for itself. But is it infectious when you have the government pushing for transparency, that by nature, the private family trading groups, which control so much wealth, particularly in the Gulf states, uh, start to do the same. Are we seeing rapid change as a result or not? Uh, we're seeing tremendous change in the private sector. Well, we all know the saying that the first, you know, the founder starts the company, the second generation grows it, and the third one destroys it. And we all, we all know that uh, 
from moving from first to second, you lose 30% of the companies in private sector. Moving from second to third, you can lose 50% of sure. the remaining. And I think more and more uh, uh, family-run businesses are aware of this. And this is why, in my opinion, there is more of a need of good governance in family business. First, when you have fewer shareholders, if you can, if there is a fight, the fight can be intensive. It's different than having million shareholders. When you have concentrated shareholders, it is. So it is, it's imperative that you have good governance in family business because good governance is the backbone of any enterprise. And it really having good governance builds and enforces trust, which is very much needed. What I wanna say about good governance, since I have the floor here, but I leave it, is that for me, the concept of good governance is not only monitoring, it is also being responsible for choosing the right leadership. Mm. Because what makes a company successful is having the right leadership, the right tools, the right processes, and all of that. And for a family business, this is very important. I do agree with His Excellency and Amin and all. We should not have governance that becomes bureaucratic. We should start with the size of the organization. So we start with, with it and you grow as, nobody can reach Aramco with, with the size and all of this of the governance, but they are an example for a large government enterprise of this. But I think it's a, also we should never take things for granted. It's a continuous process. We in the Ling Group, we continue. We started internal audit, code of contact, compliance, risk register. So it's a continuous, continuous uh, journey. Yeah, and I, I thought, I mean, Nasser's analogy of the dashboard that sits on his desk, as you can peek in at all times and never get too complacent. Uh, is a pretty good lesson for us. Uh, Abu Dhabi Global Markets, uh, Ahmed Al Sai, is, uh, we're great. it's great to have you here in, in Riyadh. Uh, you equate governance with uh, the level of trust. You said that trust, particularly if you're a new financial center, trying to put in new products into the market, uh, trust is absolutely essential, but you don't want to stifle innovation. So this is interesting when it comes to governance, because you want to bring new products to the market, but you have to have that trust in which to do so. How do, how do these work hand in hand at ADGM, would you suggest? Thank you, great to be in this distinguished panel. ADGM, I think, focused on innovation, uh, came after our launch. So this is our third year of operation. We worked very hard in establishing uh, best governance practices for our participating companies. So the rules, again, to echo what you've said, the, the rules are what you all know, they are there, they are best practice. We, we are a common law jurisdiction. The clarity of those rules, the uh, application uh, of them over the years is, is very well known to everybody. But innovation came later. And I think uh, to uh, emphasize the, the, the sentiment here. We, you can stifle uh, innovation and you can make it hard if your rules are not tailor-made to each segment that you are attracting. So in uh, ADGM, you, uh, we, we are uh, focused on fintech. And for fintech, the uh, good companies that come in that need uh, regulatory uh, hand-holding are different from uh, the big banks that are well uh, versed in this uh, field. So we've established RegLab. Uh, today we are about to uh, in, in induct the third uh, group of uh, companies into this RegLab. They come in into this RegLab for two years and they are provided with uh, they want to test their products. They want to pilot their products in a regulated uh, environment. And so we bring them in. Uh, they have to be ready to market, so they're not startups. They have to have a, a shareholders, a money, and, and financing. And they come in into the Reg Lab, and they spend two years in the Reg Lab where we help them test their products. So this is... Uh, something that's very successful. We're actually 
second to London now in, in the number of uh, fintech firms in, in a rig lab. Uh, and, and we're proud of this. The third group is going to be, uh, there's going to be focus on SMEs. And we hope we can provide the solutions, the regulatory solutions for this, uh, for these companies. And, and the same now applies to our guidelines on cryptos and uh, and ICOs. We think regular, uh, normal regulators will take too long to understand uh, this industry. And we, in order for us to understand as regulators, we have to let them in. So actually this reg lab helped us. There are in this reg lab uh, one exchange, crypto exchange. So this has helped us learn from the industry. I think the, the other lesson we, we have from this is humility. Uh, go good governance, uh, I think, must be underlined by the desire to change and, and learn. And we, we are doing this through the Reg Lab, and we are very, uh, very pleased with the results. Um, this is the year of, we're celebrating 100 years of Sheikh Zayed uh, legacy. Sheikh Zayed uh, ha, was a poet, he was a great leader, but was also a poet. And he has a, a poem uh, that I think addresses the essence of what you started this um, asking me, which is trust. Sheikh Zayed يقول عن الكثير الصدق بيسد والصدق بانت مواريث. Essentially, the truth will set you uh, free in, uh, in, in English, but for trust to take place, you need uh, burhan, you need uh, evidence, you need proof that uh, what you are doing, you can't, I can't tell you, trust me, you know, you, I have to have a reputation for being uh, trusted. And I think to do that, in a, in, a, in a financial, uh, international financial hub for us, from the beginning, we wanted to make sure we consult with the industry. So nothing we produce is, is you know, produced only internally. We, we produce it after a period of consultation with the industry. Regulators in, the, in, in Saudi Arabia today are doing this. We didn't, they, they didn't used to do this in the, in the past, but the, the, the uh, central bank and the CMA, they are doing this. We used to r just receive guidelines uh, in the past. So I think th trust is also a two-way stream. For us to deliver trust, we must uh, open the, the door to p p participants to come and, and uh, help us understand the, the issue. With, that, with this help, I think we, we can reach, uh, I think this is a great call by 2030 to, to change our, uh, uh, because we, we don't rank the best, and if you look at the World Bank, uh, you know, index. We are not in the bottom, but we're not the best. So to get to the best, what the minister called us all to work towards, I think we need to listen, and I think we need to be humble, and I think we need to experiment a little bit, take some risks. Okay, very good, excellent. And uh, I'm gonna finish up on the first questions with Alan uh, Bajani, because he's an investor, but let's bring in uh, Rick uh, Hathornway, because you talked about uh, an ecosystem uh, manage an ecosystem. Uh, what does that mean in terms of the complexities of what you've heard from Khalid Al Fali and Amin Nasser? The spirit seems to be the same: government, big companies, small enterprises, and making sure they work together in, in governance. What are you suggesting, Rick? I think there are, there are great similarities. I, mean, I was struck when listening to um, the president and CEO of Saudi Aramco and His Excellency the Minister um, first that. Uh, there seem to be actions behind the words in the governance uh, in Saudi Arabia today, um, which I've got to say, in the world of governance, 
where there are far more coaches than practitioners, that's very refreshing. Uh, but if you, if you think about governance to date, a lot of it has really been thought through the lens of governance of the corporate entity and its stakeholders and its obligations to society. And that, that the boundaries have gradually increased, but it's still through the lens of the corporation. How does one resolve conflicts of interest? How does one resolve the dilemmas? What are the power relationships, the roles, accountabilities, and such like? Um, but in, increasingly in this uh, dynamic, fast-changing world, uh, we're thinking a, about ecosystems. And ecosystems in which competitiveness depends on a healthy ecosystem, and in which actually the vital stock of trustworthiness, that's the foundation of a really healthy society, business community, is inextricably linked between all elements of those ecosystems. And too often around the world, quite often people think they can bring down other parts of the ecosystem to their own end in terms of building stock of trustworthiness. But that's clearly not playing out very well elsewhere in the world. So you know, to think about the governments that um, regulate to instruct or incent openness, transparency, competitiveness, innovation. Um, the major corporations, whether incumbent or incoming, who actually have deep in their values and purpose a belief that innovation is key to driving up revenues and bringing down costs. And a disruptor community that has taken on a recognition that they're not only disrupting for the present, but they have a responsibility to bridge to new futures that give due regard to businesses' role in society and society's um, legitimate concerns about the future of work, inequality, state of the planet, privacy, all of those issues that are there. Mm. If this ecosystem is thinking in that way, and there is at least some alignment of values and purpose through that, then we have the, the foundation of good governance. And, and rules, bylaws follow, which seems entirely consistent with the message of His Excellency and the speakers to date. But I think it's, if we think about throwing down the gauntlet about how the Saudi Arabia been becoming the vanguard by 2030 of this, it's, that's one element thinking about it. how does regulation of an ecosystem work that is truly values-based and collaborative across the every, every boundary. Okay, very quick follow-up from you and then I'll bring in uh, Alan. WPP, it's interesting to see Martin Searle out the door. It's a company he brought from the brink of bankruptcy in the early 90s. I remember covering him uh, in London at the time, created, uh, if not the largest, right there with Publicis, one of the largest advertising and services groups in the world. And within a few days, he's out the door. What's it tell us about governance today, the push for transparency, the influence of social media in your view? Healthy, not healthy? Uh, what are your views on an exit like th of that scale? Well, and I, I think Martin built an extraordinary corporation and he founded it. And there was an enormous amount of respect for Martin as he built that. And I think that that bought him a lot of runway when there were other things where in, in the, the corporate governance world right now, whether it's uh, remuneration or transparency, it was a corporation that was not exactly at the leading edge. You ask whether it's healthy, it's a reality. Um, when you think about the, the ecosystem, the most powerful player in that ecosystem is the customer as consumer and citizen now. And you know, mm. Martin was more aware of that than, than any, and I think Martin was very quick to make a decision, which tells, him, tells you something about Martin's continuous awareness. Yeah, it's fascinating. In fact, the decision came on a Saturday uh, in rapid fire. Uh, Alan, I, I put you as the cleanup hitter in the American va vernacular, the guy who can uh, carry his weight, uh, certainly no matter when I call on him. I wanted to have you uh, chime in last because you're an investor in the country. Mm -hmm. So speaking to Ahmed's points of trust and the vice minister's points about transparency with financial numbers, uh, you just secured a license for uh, the cinema screens, uh, bringing 600 to the market, 16 billion reals overall, investors, almost $5 billion. Uh, Trust had to be a key factor. It's a market you can't ignore, $700 billion of GDP, but you don't go in blindly. T tell us where the governance factors come into your decision making. Thank you. I mean, just a small 
uh, a small comment on what we talked on government. I think your example about S Martin Sorel's exit is actually quite telling. I think we, on governance generally, we, we, we tend to lose the forest for the trees. Governance is not just about structures, the way you structure governance. Governance are a set of principles that are very basic and very simple. This is why they are the most daunting principles. Primarily, it's about independence and an outside in view about in what you're doing. It's bringing someone into what you are doing in your most intimate, basically, uh, uh, space. This is why governance is difficult. Oh. And governance... So it's a stretch to let people in, of right? Of course. Is what you're thinking. Because there is no governance with people from within. You know, this is not governance. Huh. You know? <laughs> this, is, this is something else. That's number one. Number two, there are certain principles, I think, since, since the Magna Carta that we have, I think, as humanity, we have all, we all accept. For example, independence of judiciary. You wouldn't think even if the, if the judiciary is not independent in any country, to have a judge to be, as w to be a, a minister at the same time. Okay. There are certain principles that we all accept that are fundamental rights, that are becoming kind of natural rights. <coughs> in governance, it's the same. You cannot have governance if you don't separate ownership from management. Hmm. It's, it's a principle. It's not something that you can even discuss if you want governance. Now, I know that there are two schools of thought in that respect. But in reality, and I think to Rubna's point, generational, the generational issues, and how the first generation basically builds the business and the second generation and the third, I think the right step is actually to move from the first generation to professional management hmm. and professional governance. And it is the full-time job to be a founder and a shareholder of a business without managing the business. I lead a business with a fantastic visionary founder that founded this business, that continues to be in there, but does not manage the business, nor he chairs the board of the group. You know, there is, I think, in our part of the world. He doesn't chair the board. No, he does not. Very interesting. Yeah. Okay. The what happens when there's a conflict between the board and your uh, founder chairman? Well, the board is appointed by the chairman, is appointed by the shareholder, and the, the shareholder has two fundamental, I would say, two fundamental jobs appointing the board and appointing the external auditors. That's what the shareholder does. A founder has more of an, has more of an influence on, the, on a business. Even if that founder ends up with 1% of a business or less than that, the founder is always overshadowing a business, is always there because the DNA of the business is his own DNA. Mm. But I think in our part of the world, there is an under, I would say, uh, how would I say it? We undervalue the role of a shareholder or of an owner of a business, and we overvalue the role of the leader that actually leads the business in terms of managing the business. Being the shareholder of a business is actually a, a full-time job, especially in family-owned businesses and where you have generations coming in. These people have to, have to actually dedicate themselves to understand their role as shareholders in order to allow their businesses to flourish. Because sometimes, and you see that in SME, uh, in startups, and so on, you might be the right founder, but not the right leader for the business in terms of managing the business. And I think <laughs> governance is actually more about accepting certain basic principles. Without them, you cannot have, in my opinion, you cannot have real governance. Okay, stop there, because then I'll come back to your Saudi investment. I'll bring Lubna in, yeah. if you don't mind. Uh, w does this ring true for you, Lubna, as uh, a, a family uh, shareholder uh, and a very active CEO who's grown the business uh, from the first generation? Uh, we should say you have a pillow there because you have a very bad back. Yeah. So Explain Badr and, yourself, and I apologize. and everybody else appreciate the fact that you even showed up. So okay. thanks very much. No, thank you. You're very humble about it. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, I think I personally don't like to generalize. This worked very well for Majid al Fatim, who is a good friend and I respect and I admire him very much. He was the founder of the business. For us, the founder, we're a 70 year company. The founder of the business was my father. And then uh, three of us, of four siblings, are involved in the company. Now, when I want to put it in perspective in Saudi Arabia or in the Arab world, we have more than 15,000 employees, and you had two family members. So, 
we are very professional. I mean, you have to rely on professional management, there it is. Uh, I don't agree totally with, with Alain that the role of the founder is to uh, you know, choose the board and uh, uh, choose the auditor. It, it, it's different for different people. It works for different people and it worked very well for Majid al -Putain. <coughs> He has fantastic professional management for us. Uh, if there are people, I mean, we believe in meritocracy. If, the, if an individual or a family member is capable of doing, running the business, so be it. If it isn't, our role, what we're investing in, is making sure that the future shareholders, the future owners, can be very good board members. Not everyone is going to be involved in running in the business, but we have a responsibility to educate and our future shareholders, so they can monitor and make sure the business is very well run. Great. Alan, let's go back to your investment here in the trust factor uh, in the kingdom. I noted it's a big yeah. market. Everybody wants to be here, but you've got land rights uh, involved in your shopping malls. It's cutting edge, bringing entertainment to the, the city. I'm going to ask everybody to be a bit brief because we. Yeah. I want to get the two or three rounds of questions in, but go ahead, Alan. Well, I think, in short, one, I think it's the best time to invest in Saudi Arabia. I mean, we've been in Saudi Arabia for 14 years with Carrefour, and we have been expanding our, our investment since then. Uh, yes, we are investors, but we are actually operators. So the DNA of Majd al Futem, we are operators, not just investors. And, and that's, we're much more on the ground, you know, on a daily basis, building businesses from scratch. I really believe that what's happening today in Saudi Arabia in terms of, I mean, I'm not going to expand on that, everyone talks about it, and I think it's to, to a large extent a given, but from our standpoint, it's absolutely the right time to invest in Saudi Arabia. This is a market that everyone wanted to be in, you're absolutely right. I think the market is open, and this is the market that is in, in, bet, in better shape than ever. Simply because, and I always say it, Saudi Arabia today is dealing with its issues, and is seriously dealing with its issues. Saudi Arabia, like any other country, had issues, but these issues are, were not attended to the way it is being attended to today. From a foreign direct investor, if you want, standpoint, and a local operator in the country, today we have clarity on where Saudi Arabia is going. We have a plan that is very clear. Now, of course, there's a lot of thoughts and ideas around it. Do you do it this way? Do you do it that way? But it's that irrelevant. This is the first time where we have a plan where Saudi Arabia is going on every sector that you are interested in, but also the economy in general. And not just that, social reforms, political outlook, efficiency of government, effectiveness of the economy, role of the private sector, and so on. Now, I'm not saying that everything's perfect. It's not going to be perfect. It's never perfect. But this is a country that has so much potential, and that potential was encapsulated in a way, and now it's being liberated. Of course, governance has a big role to play in really building the foundation, not just building the foundation, but making sure that the future of Saudi Arabia and the involvement of the private sector in the economy is actually proper. Mm. And there is a lot to be done there. But the one thing that I, coming from Dubai and the UAE, I can see, the government has a big role to play at certain, I would say, juncture of history of certain countries where you are moving from one situation to another to actually ignite a new reality. Because as Lubna said, we all private sector tend to be sometimes a little bit over cautious with capital. And that's absolutely right, especially for publicly listed companies that actually work with capital that, is, that they don't own 100%. We're 100% owned business. We all continue to believe that. Today we have the, for example, I mean, we're in, in different sectors. You mentioned the cinema. We're going to open the first cinema next week. And these are all sectors that are being liberated, and it's a reality on the ground. The big, for me, the big, I would say, uh, uh, cautious, ca caution is one to make sure that we end up in a situation where the government is actually competing with the private sector. Saudi Arabia today has an opportunity to unleash the private sector properly. And I know that there are always temptations to do it ourselves. Huh. But since we're talking about governance and since we're talking within, the, within this environment, which, uh, I think we, there is a big opportunity to, to unleash the private sector, being it the, 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 the Saudi private sector and the regional and global private sector being invited, sincerely invited in. I was very impressed in Davos when I saw the delegation of ministers and Your Excellency and the other ministers that were there. 
talking in such clarity, and actually they were probing people to ask them questions about what's happening in Saudi Arabia. And that was quite refreshing. And this is something that is, has been unheard of before. It's the first time we see it, and it's actually quite welcome. Very good, thanks. Uh, Rick, I'm gonna then bring in the Vice Minister and Ahmed Al Sayed, but I think to Alan's point here, it hasn't been pretty in many instances, and a lot of the questions that came up in Davos, because I was with the Saudi delegation quite often, uh, were the questions about the crackdown on corruption, the methodology of it, the surprise nature of it, three weeks in the same venue after a major investment forum. I think it'd be excellent to get somebody of your caliber at the corporate level, global level, actually, with uh, MasterCard, on the methodology and what do you see of it now, you know, uh, six, seven months later? Well, I think one take, makes any judgment naturally from what is the context of it. And the context of this was a, a time when Vision 2030 was seen as very progressive, when, uh, as was mentioned, there were delegations going around the world uh, with whom we were having quite extraordinary conversations that cut to the chase and, and actually were uh, surrounded by good governance and, and just the, the right questions. Uh, and therefore, there's, there's naturally uh, a presumption of, of trust in decisions that are made within the local cultural context. I think one of the, the issues is always that uh, owning the narrative. And, and although the narrative came out, what, 72 hours later, the rest of the world have decided its own narrative at that point is very difficult to put that back in a bottle. So, right. I mean, for me, that's the only the lesson to be learned from that. But it, you know, the overall context has been transformational over the last uh, 18 months, two years. Okay, great. I have a question for each of uh, our distinguished panelists here. I want to spot the microphones because I want to open the floor to questions. Do we have the microphones in the audience? Great. Once you have one of them, just come near the front. Uh, do we have any questions to begin with? Okay, we have one here. Let's get a microphone to this gentleman and then a microphone to the gentleman in that row and I'll pick up and we have Good, we have three questions. I want to get to them quickly. I think this is a very important question, and I know Ahmed makes it a priority. Uh, you know, I've hosted Marketplace Middle East for 10 years. I'm a big believer in the Middle East and North Africa. I'm a big believer in the GCC acting as a single market. Uh, when can that filter into finance, getting the governance structure for Saudi Arabia and the UAE to look at each other and say, you know, we're not silos. Uh, Bader talked about in his opening comments here. Let's break down the silos. How do we collaborate as a single market in financial services? We know what it's done for the European Union, uh, uh, as an example. We have to be quick because of time. But do you think it is time to start thinking that way? And they'll get Ahmed to jump in as well. Uh, as you know, there is a, a close cooperation and very strong one with the UAE. Yes. And uh, know that we are talking to the Ministry of Finance and UAE and to make sure that we, we, we at least to exchange uh, experiences and to, to benefit from each other's experience. Uh, it's very important that some of in a, some areas they are uh, they are uh, implementing some uh, in some areas be ahead of us, and some we are ahead of them. And we we are close, and we are we are talking to each other uh, very often, and we meet actually as in, uh, in ministries of finance, and there are sometimes in the uh, umbrella of Arab finance ministers and other, uh, and even GCC, we, and we exchange, as I said, experiences. And they have some, uh, I know that Ministry of Finance and UAE done some kind of uh, ch change uh, before, uh, before us. And, uh, and we, uh, we send, for example, in their uh, implementation of government statistics, IMF, uh, the, mm. the 2001 and 2014, and we sent people to to uh, to UAE to to, to uh, see and look at their experience and how. So we I can follow up, though, Vice Minister, uh, in the spirit of time here. Don't we think, in the pace of change that's taking place in the world, that the acceleration of more collaboration and cross-border investment needs to go at a much faster pace as well? Isn't it a fair comment? It's moving at a snail's pace. It seems like. You are right. I think there is a need to accelerate, but at the same time, we need also to, to, to watch our steps moving forward. It's very important. Just to be methodical. Ahmed, what are your thoughts on this uh, subject? Well, equivalency is a prerequisite for financial products to move be between different markets. I think today our markets 
are more or less equivalent. So the, the governance here at, uh, in, in, in Saudi Arabia, the governance in uh, uh, the UAE for banks, for uh, public companies is robust, is more or less the same. What stops passporting of financial services between uh, these uh, countries is, is the protocols uh, the vice minister was talking about. We need these protocols and we need, I hope I can talk to Tadawan today about uh, actually one idea for uh, remote uh, brokers between our market and, uh, and, and Tadawal. Tadawal is, for example, uh, the most important uh, market today in, uh, in, the, in the Middle East. Any equivalent regime, any passporting needs to recognize this and, and needs to under, and, uh, underwrite that value for, for, the, for their benefit. I agree with you, it's slow. So we need to do it faster and we need to make sure uh, we understand that this, these are not things we are, we are inventing. So passporting of financial services is something that can be done uh, very, very efficiently today without undermining uh, the uh, national markets. And I think I would love to be part of this uh, first mover into this space. Well, wow. okay, that's pretty clear. Uh, let's go to the questions. I'm going to ask just for brevity and questions and to make uh, life very clear. If you can direct your question to somebody on the panel or even two, and I'm going to ask uh, very quick answers from the panel, please. Uh, if we can get the mic, make sure the microphones are up, please. Thanks. Basit Al Gharaini, BNG Financial Group. Two quick questions. First one to Mr. Dijani. Is your decision to invest in the, in the, in the entertainment sector in Saudi Arabia is a uh, hedging strategy against the three or more giga projects that are happening here and gradually may take market share from Dubai. The other question to Mrs. Arayan. You announced last year that your company will go public. Are you going to go public at the holding level or individual companies will be gradually go two, public? Two good questions. This is a question I know that's coming up in the UAE. Uh, you unleash a monster. I, I call it a sleeping giant editorially. It's no longer sleeping. Uh, is this a hedge or just a good opportunity? No, it's not a hedge. It's actually a fantastic opportunity that everyone has been dreaming of for a few decades. So, you know, when it happens, you have to acknowledge it's happening. That's number one. It's not a hedge because the market, the pie is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Now, these mega projects are great projects because they actually establish new realities. There are lessons to be learned from elsewhere in terms of how to go about them. Okay, this, the pace, the size, and basically the timing of how to make sure that these projects, when they open, are actually successes. But this being said, uh, we, are, we, we are leader in leisure entertainment and we are the leader operator in cinemas in this part of the world. And the Saudi market for us is just a natural natural expansion of where we're going. So it's not a hedge. We believe there is much more to be done at any, of course, in Saudi, it's, uh, we, we haven't started yet, but also in the, in the region at large, with you look at the demographics and as your social demographics, you, it's very clear that this is a region that's actually craving more and more leisure entertainment and actually uh, world-class experiences. Good, you would agree it creates a good challenge to Dubai though, right? I mean, this is no, a, a society that spends about 30 billion a year on entertainment outside the country. Look, I think there is, there is definitely a great challenge to Dubai, but I think this is a challenge that we re will reinforce Dubai and will establish Saudi Arabia as well. I mean, we have many cities in the world that are capable of competing uh, and existing, and they are as far as each other, if not closer than, than Riyadh and, and Dubai. The reality is the world continues to grow. You know, the world is not standing still while this is growing. This is, there is growth that's happening around us. This region is becoming more and more interesting for the world at large. Yes, more visitors are coming and people are, are, are more interested. So I'm not worried about that. Okay. Uh, Ludna Ali, I'm not sure if that question is as painful as your back right now or if you wanted to talk about it. <laughs> no, actually. Um, thank you. Uh, we, we, ha uh, we have a num number of operating companies and we've identified 22 of them 
that where we are an operators and where we have the, exp many of our companies are joint ventures, but within the joint ventures, some of them we manage ourselves and some of them are managed by the joint venture partner. So we've identified 22 companies in five sectors, in buckets of five sectors, that, we are put, that we've put together uh, under our oldest holding company called Olayan Saudi Holding Company. Two of these companies are actually 70 years old. Uh, with their own set, uh, we have uh, its own set of uh, governance. We actually just, May 1st, we will have our first board meeting. We have three independent, identified three independent, that's part of the governance here, and that's why I'm saying this, independent board of directors. We have the governance structure. And we are running it until the time in that f way, until the time comes for us to go uh, public. The public timing is really depending on market conditions. Uh, it's not a surprise that many of the companies last year's performance were not what it should have been, given the economy. I mean, it's uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, um, we had four quarters of ge negative GDP growth, which impacted many of the private businesses. So we're getting it together, and yes, we're going to go. Uh, the whole entity, Ashko, will be floated on the Saudi stock exchange. It's good to see that the Olean Group and uh, Ramco seem to speak the same language. We go public with market conditions. And we'll let we the market decide. I should well, go, you two are simpatico, I see copy, here. Uh, we copy best in class. Yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a sensitive subject by any stretch of the imagination. The question there, and then uh, I think we had a microphone up top. Good, and then I'm going to come to the gentleman here. Uh, we have four quick questions, and then we'll, I'm going to take the poll. Thank you. Morning. Uh, my name is Alvin Joseph. I'm the director of Express Money. My question is directed to Mrs. Lutna. Uh, having listened to Mr. Bhatil Jaffa in his initial comments, <coughs> family-owned enterprises control almost 85% of the GDP in the region, whereas at a global level, it's probably in the region of 50%. Your comment was very much interesting, or with the humor, that family-owned enterprises, the founder finds it, the second generation rather grows it, and the third generation disposes. Though there was a bit of farm and humor content to that, I think it's a good for thought, considering the fact that Vision 2030 envisages, as His Excellency pointed out, the private sector has to grow from the current level of 40% to 65% of GDP, and the SMEs from the current level of 20 to 35%. Don't you think, ma'am, that the family-owned enterprises has a larger role to play in terms of I mean, avoiding the value erosion that has happened in terms of corporate governance to ensure that the Vision 2030 objectives of enhancing the private sector's role is to be accomplished. Could you share more light or shed some thought on it as to what exactly could be done more than what is already done in terms of improving corporate governance? Thank you. It's a very good question. I wouldn't classify that as a short one. <laughs> Lupna? Okay. Let's go. I need tighter questions, you guys. You would yeah. never make it in television. Go ahead. Well, we have to say that when we're referring to the private sector, we're not referring to private family-owned business only. Most of the companies that are on the public listed on our, on Tadawal are pri uh, publicly listed companies. And I think Vision 2030 is saying these publicly listed companies with the private sector are going to be carrying the company. We've had many discu discussions with the government, with many ministers that, okay, we can do this, but we need this, but we don't have the time to discuss this. So we need, it's a continuous dialogue uh, between us. So it's not, uh, not only, it's not only family business. I wonder whether Aramco would be considered once it's listed as a private company or not. So that's uh, another uh, uh, question that uh, Aramco would have to tackle. Now, many family businesses have gone public, Zamel, and many companies are contemplating going uh, public. And, and actually, the good thing about, I think, family businesses is they are very long-term focus. We haven't really touched on mm. governance, and I think part of the governance is the sustainability of the company and making sure that it is long-term focus. And we haven't touched as well that compensation of leadership has to be uh, locked in with the vision and the sustainability of the company. 
and so there is a short-term compensation, but we also, leadership is accountable for decisions now that are gonna impact the company five and 10 years. And I think that's a very important part. Family businesses are very conscious about that because we, we don't have to worry about our share prices. We make decisions for the long term. We're ready to take a risk. We can, and, and, and so th there is that debate. But I, I'm, very, I'm a strong believer that family businesses are very capable of taking the task and working with the government to take whatever role is given to them, especially in this environment of open dialogue between the government and the private sector. Good. Uh, I think you actually raised a lot of eyebrows in May of last year when they had the U.S.-Saudi roundtable, the Saudi-U.S. roundtable, and you said we can't make the transition from the public sector to the private sector too quickly as well. I mean, this is all a, a game of calibration. Otherwise, you're shocking the private sector and they can't grow. And I think that's what the experience was last year. And I think all the ministries took it on board uh, in fairness. They responded very quickly to the call that you made. I want to go to the uh, question for the audience, if we can bring it up, please. Uh, and on your Twitter feed, it's uh, GIF voting. So you can search it and it'll pop up as the first question. Uh, and we're going to give it a minute for the answer. Which of the following factors is the most likely to positively impact the implementation of governance frameworks in the Gulf region? A regulatory evolution, uh, investor expectations, succession planning, which Ludna just talked about, and the business case itself. So which of the following factors is most likely to positively impact the implementation of governance frameworks in the Gulf region? You have four choices there. So it's one, two, three, four in your Twitter feed. And you have one minute to vote. A little bit of music there. Uh, we're going to go to that question, and then this gentleman will wrap it. Do you have a microphone there, sir? Sir? Do you have a microphone? Okay, we'll get to one. Do you have a microphone there? Do we have a microphone for the gentleman up top, please? His hand's up. I'm curious what the panel has to say about this question as well. It's not easy, you have to crick your neck. One more choice. Oh, regulatory evolution. That must make you happy. Not necessarily. <laughs> Too much of a burden. Okay, that's interesting. 45% of regulatory evolution. 29% uh, for investor expectations, which I think managing expectations as Saudi Aramco is finding out is always important, the clarity of the message they've been giving. 10% on succession planning uh, and 16% on the business case itself. It's interesting. I thought that would score uh, a little bit higher. We don't have time to get analysis, but I think this panel could be approached after uh, the break as well. I promised the gentleman a question there uh, on that road. Do you have your microphone? Please, do you have your microphone? Yeah, sorry. Hello? Okay, let's go to the gentleman here then. And I, I promised him a question, so let's go ahead. I think it's on. All right, thank, thank you. you. Thank Very you. quick on the question, please. Thank you, John. And uh, I hope uh, you put us on CNN. I think the world would know what's happening in Saudi Arabia. But anyhow. Uh, uh, there's no, no shortage of coverage <laughs> on Saudi Arabia, I'll tell you that. <laughs> thank you. Whether I'm here or not, uh, my colleague and I cover it quite aggressively. Go yeah, ahead. I would like to say that uh, we in the Corporate Governance Center at Al Faisal University do evaluate all the companies traded on the uh, on Tadawal in the Saudi uh, financial market. And last Sunday, in fact, we celebrated the, the top winners in, uh, uh, based on the Corporate Governance Index we do calculate. And my question here is the following two questions. One. So you have to go with one question. One please. question. Yeah, all right. Tight on time. Uh, well, the question is the best performing companies, in fact, on corporate governance uh, criteria and principles are government owned companies. Oh. Given that. Uh, That's then because you don't know private sector companies. <laughs> well, uh, just clear. given that, then why privatize if things are going well for the. the for those companies, and there's research also that uh, they are performing very, very well, far better than the uh, privately owned companies in Saudi Arabia. Okay, that's interesting. Who wants to jump in on that? luca has got her hand up. I was going to ask Amin Nasser before he goes public whether he thought it was a good idea or not. I, 
I don't think you have any choice. We at this all stage, know really indices, wrong. studies, and all of this. We have to really understand how you measure, what is it you measure, what's in your criteria. So I, to be able to comment, you really need to know this. I doubt very much that there are government-run enterprises other than Aramco. You can give you a whole discussion. Uh, well, I, I would love to hear it. Otherwise, why people, why privatize? I mean, why do you have better work ethics in private sector than the government sector? Why do you have all many things? So I just challenge that premise, and I would love to see that study. Good. Thank you. Do you want to jump in quickly on this or not? Leave it? No, I just... I love to know the secret sauce you found, if that's the case, because we don't see it elsewhere in the world. Yeah, we didn't think so. Yeah, no. Go ahead. It's, it's interesting to, to, to hear this. Uh, uh, just to, to, uh, this brings to, to the academic debate uh, whether privatization of management or ownership, both management and ownership, whether the government being the bo uh, shareholder in a company uh, brings the issues that Lubna mentioned about long term, which is really something that uh, it's, it's an interesting to, to see the, the, the study. Thank you. Great. Uh, uh, I wanted, yeah, just please, Alan, and I just want to make sure the gentleman has a microphone. Do you have a microphone yet? Okay. You know, it's not so much. No, no, I, I have, I promised that gentleman that he had his first hand up. He's just going to go, that's going to be the final question. If you please take the microphone to there. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Alan, go ahead. Just in short, I mean, we're in 2018. You know, the government's role is not to run business even if they run business better than the private sector. The government has a big role to play. And that role is more important than making money or running well an organization. The, the government role is not to have hotels or to open shopping centers or to run supermarkets. I mean, this used to be the case in the, I mean, in the Soviet Union. <laughs> this model has failed. We're not in competition. The private sector has a role to play. I think that's an established truth universally. And the government has a role to play. And it's another established truth universally. And I don't think that comparisons actually are even relevant, simply because it's not the role of the government to do that. Good. I, I also don't think the government should be competing with the private sector, which is also the other challenge. OK, the final question, do you, please. Uh, if you can stand up, because we can barely see you back here. I think the microphone's on. Thank you. Good morning. Thank Good you. Uh, Faisal Kamodi from Saudi Aramco. Uh, my question is about all the corporate failures and market crashes that are happening, uh, especially starting in the, uh, in the 90s and then a decade-long corporate failures culminating in the financial crisis. Uh, 